Okay, uh, hi everyone, let's, uh, let's get started. Thank you for coming to this uh, Berkman Klein Lunch and Talk. Uh, my name is Yarden Katz. I used to be a fellow here at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, now I'm just a guy, I guess. Um, so I have a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, this is being live streamed on the web now and it's going to be recorded for posterity. It'll appear on the Berkman Klein website, so just know that if you ask a question, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be on online forever. Um, I wanna thank the events team, um, especially Carrie Anderson uh, for making this happen and Dan and Ruben as well. And uh, it's uh, really my uh, pleasure to introduce Maura Waggle, uh, my uh, colleague and friend. She's currently a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. She graduated from Harvard as an undergrad and then went to Yale for a PhD in uh, comparative literature. And uh, she's really a remarkable person. So uh, while many graduate students, uh, myself included, uh, find it generally difficult to get out of bed in the morning, uh, Maura managed to write a popular book uh, called uh, Labor of Love, The Invention of Dating while still a graduate student. And I believe this is an entirely different topic from your dissertation uh, on top of it. Uh, but uh, in many ways, Maura doesn't need uh, an introduction to many of you. She's a prolific commentator on the politics and culture of science, technology, and academia. She writes regularly for The Guardian. Uh, many of you probably read her 2017 article on what some people call the tech left, titled Coders of the World Unite. Uh, she's also the co-founder of Logic Magazine, which covers the politics of computing and technology, and I'm sure many of you are readers. Uh, Maura brings a, a critical feminist perspective to her analyses of computing and politics. She's inspired by thinkers such as the political theorist uh, Silvia Federici. Uh, when Maura examines uh, social movements forming in major tech companies, for example, she looks for the connections between gender, uh, race, and class. She pays attention to who is laboring and how, who is precarious, and crucially, who profits from uh, precarity and uh, various labor conditions. Um, this is reflected, for instance, in her uh, wonderful piece called The Internet of Women in uh, Logic Magazine, which I urge you all uh, to read. Uh, finally, just uh, another note, uh, Maura is obviously not just um, an academic, but a public intellectual in the non-derogatory sense of, of that term. Uh, and like uh, good public intellectuals in history, she uh, also has to pay the price. So uh, recently, Maura wrote a very perceptive critique of some uh, fashionable but deeply flawed book on the so-called coddling of American college students on campus. Uh, she was then harassed. Oh, they just, uh, sorry. Okay. She was then harassed, up until now apparently, uh, by a slew of trolls on social media, ironically those uh, very same people who lament uh, the death of rational argumentation. Anyway, so it's uh, great to have you here uh, today, uh, especially because I think the last major Berkman event was Mark Zuckerberg, so this is an infinite uh, step up for us. And uh, so, thank you. So uh, Maura will present and then afterwards um, I'll start with a couple of uh, brief questions and then we'll open it up to uh, all of you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Let me make sure I'm all on. All right, how's that? Can y'all hear me? Good. Um, let me get myself organized. Yeah, so I wanted to say thank you, Yarden, for that generous introduction and for shouting out my trolls. Uh, like Beyonce, Daddy taught me to love my haters. So um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And thank you to the Berkman Center team, uh, especially Carrie, for making this possible, dealing with the endless emails and logistics. And thank you, above all, to you all for being here. Uh, I'm told, oh, hi, John. Um, I'm told that there are some other talks happening at the time, and I, I'm honored that you, that you chose to spend the time with us. Given the subject matter, I'm going to be talking about new kinds of political organizing in the tech industry. I'm especially eager to hear from you all. So I'm going to try to keep my remarks relatively brief and leave a lot of time for conversation. I've called my talk today, Goodbye California, but with a question mark, Goodbye California. I voice the title this way because my central argument is not that anything has been settled, but that we are right now entering a moment of new questions. Recent developments have cast long-held beliefs about the politics of technology, of the tech industry, and of digital networks themselves into doubt, 
And it's precisely this uncertainty and possibility that I want us to, as it were, lean into. Yeah, if it seems like I'm trying to be funny, I probably am. <laughs> I invite you to, uh, to laugh, despite the seriousness of much of the subject matter. For decades, the view has prevailed that tech workers are predominantly liberal and libertarian. So too is the idea that online engagement is democratic and democratizing, and therefore serves politically progressive agendas. This is the hegemony that the media theorists Richard Barbrook uh, and Cameron uh, named in 1995 the California ideology, hence goodbye California. However, recent reports about the growing number of both white nationalist, the folks remember that article in The Stranger that this graphic comes from? White nationalist and socialist engineers challenge previous assumptions about their political views. And a series of crises regarding disinformation and hate speech have raised the question of whether such problems are, as the saying goes, bugs or features. There's also a geographic, geopolitical aspect to this question uh, that's part of my work but I won't really get into today about GDPR, the rise of the Chinese internet, which I think also calls us to reevaluate our received ideas. The ongoing so-called tech backlash demands a reevaluation of both the politics of networks and the people who build and maintain them. Such a reevaluation itself raises the question, were the dominant accounts always wrong or did something change? Did they become wrong? Some of the new tendencies recently foregrounded in media have in fact existed for a long time. I recommend Jesse Daniels' book, Cyber Racism, from 2009, and sections of Kathleen Ballou's Bring the War Home that deal with white nationalist organizing on Usenet as early as the early 1980s. Other parts of my research also look at what I call right cyber utopianism in the 90s, uh, where there's the use, not, there's the idea not only of a kind of um, right-wing counter-public sphere, uh, but also enthusiasm for using data to sort of renaturalize race and gender categories. But other tendencies, the tendencies I'm going to focus on, seem more authentically new. Uh, today I'm going to talk mostly about the, the new network of activists I named, as Yarden mentioned, the tech left. I've been covering uh, this movement in a variety of places. Logic, the magazine I started, also published uh, a record, sorry, I co-started, uh, published a record of some of their early actions in June 2017 in a book called Tech Against Trump. And I imagine that a lot of folks here have read at least a little bit about them. Am I? Yes. So I want to situate recent big media stories uh, about the Google walkout and other actions in a longer and deeper trajectory. And in order to do that, I'm going to do two things. Uh, first, I'm going to run pretty quickly through a sort of timeline of events that give us a shared context uh, about these organizing efforts over the past few years. And then I'm going to step back and talk about a few new attempts to theorize this conjuncture, uh, which the organizers and activists I've spent time with are in some cases actively studying ideas like platform capitalism, data colonialism, uh, and perhaps most influentially, the, um, Shoshana Zuboff's work on surveillance capitalism. So introducing the tech left. Ooh, actually, I jumped ahead. So activists that we interviewed for the 2017 logic book, Tech Against Trump, when they started to talk to us about their experience of being politicized, often pointed to one date, December 9th, 2016, and even specifically to one image. Do you all remember this day? This was the te so-called tech summit uh, brokered by, by Peter Thiel to bring tech executives to speak to Trump at Trump Tower. Because many tech executives who had opposed Trump seemed to be cozying up to him, this baffled the people we interviewed, the people who mentioned it, because they were in an industry where they tended to think of their bosses as liberal and their values as liberal, tended to think also that they had a high degree of freedom and control over their work. Images like this uh, and the prospect of the industry fulfilling, were, you know, making tools that could be used to fulfill some of Trump's campaign process, uh, promises raised the troubling prospect for engineers that they might be working on projects whose political effects they directly opposed. New concerns in the wake of the Trump election intersected with ongoing concerns of community organizers and activists in the Bay Area about how the tech industry was affecting the region, including soaring costs of living, the epidemic of homelessness, 
So in some cases, again, activists we spoke to for Tech Against Trump cited specific examples of these, of these features of life in the Bay Area negatively impacting people they knew and people in their companies, not to mention many of the people they worked with, the other tech workers, not engineers, who I'll, we'll talk about more later. Historically, there's been relatively little organizing, labor organizing in Silicon Valley. There were some efforts to organize engineers in the 1980s with traditional unions like CWA and SEIU that were mostly unsuccessful. Leslie Berlin, the historian of Silicon Valley, in an interview talked to me about efforts uh, in a slightly earlier period to organize low-wage women of color who worked making computer chips, many of them Mexican and Vietnamese, and the difficulties that those intercultural and linguistic challenges posed. Historically, uh, scholars of the Valley, like Annalie Saxenian, have talked about how its work structures and rhythms make it an unusually difficult place to organize. People have short job tenures. They're generally friendly relations uh, among tech workers and their managers. Uh, and, and the sort of what she called, named the ecology of Silicon Valley, she, Valley, she argued, made it very difficult to organize uh, in a sort of binary way, workers against management. Nonetheless, I think in the past few years, we've seen that these same properties of fluidity and sort of socializing among tech workers can actually catalyze large actions, uh, building, building very fast. Employee resource groups, ERGs, have also played an important role. So in response to new concerns that developed following the Trump election, a series of actions have taken place focus both on internal issues, so issues internal to the dynamics of tech companies, and external problems, uh, ways that their products are impacting the world. And I think part of what's especially novel about what's happening has been the connections that tech worker activists are drawing between these two categories of concern. So this, the, first, uh, the first major point I want to highlight was the Never Again Pledge. Do folks remember this going up? Did anyone see this at the time? I think it was January 2017. Uh, this was put up by a group. I think it was signed by over 1,300 workers at various tech companies. Uh, the title, of course, Never Again Pledge, was meant to evoke the history of IBM's work with the Nazi regime, as well as South African apartheid. At the time, I remember they were reading groups, at least in the Bay Area, who were reading IBM, Edwin Black's book, IBM and the Holocaust, together, uh, about the IBM punch card systems that were crucial for you know, data services for the Nazis, for the deportation and extermination of the Jews in Europe. The contemporary issues that the pledge foregrounded had to do with the use of social media and other data to construct and maintain databases, related concerns about encryption, data log scrubbing, and the history of policing databases. Another action, a set of actions, were staged early by a group with some overlapping membership, the Tech Workers Coalition. Tech Workers Coalition, often abbreviated TWC, was co-founded, in fact, in 2014, before this sort of latest wave of organizing I described, by a cafeteria worker turned Unite Here organizer and by an engineer. Initially, the organization focused on conditions of service work in Silicon Valley, so primarily cafeteria workers and security workers on tech campuses and workers at hotels frequented by tech conferences. But after the election, they too turned to issues related to software and surveillance. And here are some photos from an action they staged at Palantir headquarters in January 2017, I believe. Uh, right before the Trump inauguration, and from an action, a block party that some of their group attended at Peter Thiel's house a few months later. Tech Workers Coalition has been, uh, has continued, sort of stood out, I think, in the landscape in that it continues to emphasize solidarity with not just engineers, but other tech workers. Service workers engage in ongoing unionization efforts, and here's a photo from a May Day parade in 2017 and a flyer that was released uh, when they won their union in 2018, I think, was official. It became official. And there were also a series of more spontaneously organized events, again, with overlapping organization uh, and participation. 
Tech Stands Up, uh, which grew out of a Facebook post that someone put up in early 2017 and led to an event with thousands of people on Pi Day uh, in March 2017. We're all dorks. Uh, and uh, here, too, I have a photo from, from an early event uh, called the Abortion Access Hackathon that was put together by feminist organizers in San Francisco. Last summer, in 2018, a new cycle of worker-led actions captured media attention. These were focused primarily on algorithmic warfare, Project Maven at Google, and these, by the way, are memes that circulated internally uh, at Google that Google workers made uh, to promote and draw attention to their opposition to the project. Let's see. This was an especially, especially a widely shared one, uh, according to the folks I've talked to there. And uh, at other companies, uh, there were also protests from employees uh, demanding that their bosses end cooperation with Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, saying that they did not want to build tools that would be used to harass, deport, arrest, incarcerate migrants. And this really escalated last July in a series of public actions or signs for the people doing a solidarity action and a protest at Microsoft. Just last week, uh, oh, this is also from Salesforce. Let's see, actions at Salesforce last summer. Ooh, and how could I forget? This is about recognition. Um, Amazon's facial recognition cloud service, uh, which also became the subject of an open letter, I think it was last November, uh, from Amazon employees to Bezos. I think uh, Yarden said he's going to mention, get into more detail about the most recent one of these public statements, a letter from, from Microsoft employees that went up just last week uh, regarding IVAS, Integrated Visual Augmentation Systems. So I'll save that uh, for our Q&A. So two things have been striking throughout these actions. Sorry. <laughs> One is a new kind of relationship between tech worker activists and the media. Many of these actions took place at the same time and sometimes directly in response to media reports from publications like The Intercept and The New York Times, like this New York Times story uh, about how Google protected a high-level executive from charges of sexual harassment that directly led to the organizing and the Google walkout last November when 20,000 people walked out of various Google offices around the world. But in addition and more significantly, more deeply probably than this relationship to the media, the thing that strikes me as new is the philosophy that's being used to frame these actions, that's being articulated in relation to them. The organizers of these actions are framing their demands using this phrase tech worker, which is a kind of provocation I'd say in itself, a kind of has a solidaristic overtone and that they're not self-describing as engineers necessarily, um, but as people in an industry. In this capacity, the tech worker movement is articulating, this is, well, even though it's playing out in all these different areas, a fairly coherent philosophy, I would argue, demanding more control over their work and more transparency about the purposes of what they build, and finally, insisting that the conditions of their own workplaces have an important relationship to that. So insisting uh, that the conditions inside a tech company are related to its effects in the world, and I recently heard one organizer say, you know, the people who are treated badly within Google probably tend to look like the people who are impacted most negatively by, by products we create. While the absolute number of people involved in organizing these actions may be relatively small, it's clear that they're affecting the opinions of their colleagues. Just a few days ago, a survey conducted by BuzzFeed News and Lucid came out that showed that, I thought this was striking, only 31% of tech workers, quote, somewhat agree or strongly agree that US-based US tech companies should operate in China. And I think that reflects uh, a lot of the organizing around the Dragonfly search engine. And then this statistic, uh, which was that only 59% agree or believe that their company should work with the US military, which I thought, you know, while it's still in a majority, is a strikingly low number uh, to say that 41% of all tech employees say they should not work with the military, particularly when you think of the history of Silicon Valley. So 
I'll wrap up in just a few minutes, but I wanted to briefly say a bit about the broader sort of theoretical or intellectual frame for thinking about these questions. How do these actions break with the received image of the politics of technology, both the politics of the people who build and maintain networks and the politics, as I was saying in my opening remarks, of the networks themselves? This is the larger intellectual or theoretical challenge that I'm trying to work out through my own research on these movements. As I mentioned earlier, I named this talk Goodbye California in honor of an influential essay that two British academics published in 1995, The Californian Ideology. Do folks know that essay? Is that something people have read? Like 30%, okay. Then the teacher in me is gonna lecture about this essay for just a minute. At the time, they were affiliated with a center called the Center for Hypermedia Research in London. They refer briefly to French Minitel, and I feel like part of the context of the essay implicitly is about wanting possibilities for different kinds of networks, different kinds of webs than they see rising in the United States at the time in Europe. Anyway, Barbrook and Cameron describe the politics of Silicon Valley. This is what the Californian ideology as a phrase is supposed to capture as a synthesis of socially liberal attitudes inherited from Bay Area countercultures with a, quote, anti-statist gospel of cybernetic libertarianism. The philosophy, they wrote, promiscuously combines the freewheeling spirit of the hippies and the entrepreneurial zeal of the yuppies while mixing the social liberalism of the new left and the economic liberalism of the new right. It's why they propose Wired Magazine could put a flattering interview, relatively, of Newt Gingrich on their cover. The authors of the Californian ideology emphasize that this hybrid, this kind of new hybrid ideology, and you could think of you know, my, my predecessor apparently in this role, Mark Zuckerberg, distributing the little red book to all the Facebook employees, uh, you know, this sort of curious assimilation of, of libertarian and supposedly liberal politics, they argued is made possible, it's a hybrid made possible through, quote, a nearly universal belief in technological determinism, a faith that digital technologies would, on their own, lead back to a kind of idealized, individualized liberalism of the past. They cited also the strong influence of Marshall McLuhan. These restyled McLuhanites, the Californian ideology reads, vigorously argue that big government should stay off the backs of resourceful entrepreneurs, who are the only people cool and courageous enough to take risks. Following the election of Gingrich, they concluded the, a right-wing version of the Californian ideology was ascendant, a free market anti-status version that conveniently forgot, neglected the fact that these technologies only existed because of massive state investments historically. They quipped, quote, the Americans have always had state planning, only they called it the defense budget. So of course, those of us who study uh, these questions in an academic context are from, will be familiar with other scholars who have articulated versions of this argument. Fred Turner's Counterculture to Cyberculture comes to mind. So too does Wendy Chun's trilogy, Program Visions, Freedom and Control, and Updating to Remain the Same. This idea that computers became central to a logic of neoliberalism, that they embodied uh, a certain vision, I like to say, you know, there's no such thing as society, only men and women in the network. Uh, that this is an idea that in academic circles has become pretty familiar. If the key characteristic of this ideology, however, was the idea, was a certain kind of technological determinism, an idea that better designed tools could, could fix it, could supplant politics, then I would argue that this is precisely what the new tech worker movement is calling into question, sort of insisting on seeing technology as embedded in and expressive of social relations. You could say they leave the marketplace of ideas on the web and descend into the workshop of digital production. Of course, various theorists have been trying to talk about the nature of accumulation and power on the web for a long time. Uh, it's really in the 90s already you see autonomous Marxists trying to theorize the nature of value accumulation in the digital sphere. Tiziana Terranova's account of free labor, a free labor user-generated content as free labor comes to mind. And maybe in the Q&A we could get into a little bit why I think Marxist feminists actually have some of the best uh, ideas for talking about this topic. 
But in just the past couple of years, it's striking that we've seen a number of influential works trying to formulate a new name for this kind of capitalism that we're in. So there's Nick Cernicek's Platform Capitalism. Julie Cohen is maybe more familiar to folks at the law school, her concept of the biopolitical public domain. Nick Kuldry and Ulysses Mayhas's Data Colonialism, which Joanna Radin also talks about in her work on digital natives. But I suggested earlier one of the most influential formulations has been the concept of surveillance capitalism. That's the one I've heard come up with the organizers I spend time with and talk to, which provides an account of how a new economy around data extraction and analysis and new kinds of contractual forms is emerging. Without getting into the details of any of these accounts, because as I said, I want to leave time for us to have a conversation, I think what's very interesting uh, about, about this new scholarship uh, that's being cited on digital capitalism is both that it's non-technologically deterministic in the way that I was saying, and also that it provides, it provides a kind of model of a chain of value accumulation online that I think the, tech new, the new tech worker movements are using to situate themselves and relate to other, in relation to other users of technology. I think there's an argument to be made that we're all tech workers insofar as we all are part of the processes that generate value for companies like Facebook and Google. So in conclusion, and to lighten things up a little, I wanted to play a short video that some of you may have seen the other night. Did anyone watch the Oscars? No one? Oh, good for you. Um, so I thought I, would, I thought I would just quickly play a, a, short, a short film that appeared uh, during the Oscars. And if you've seen it, let's watch it. Ooh, how's the sound? Sorry. Janelle is breaking my heart. Let's see. Good for the world. Oh, good. But I feel like you have the potential to do so much more. Are you working for all of us or just a few of us? Can we build AI without bias? AI that fights bias. AI that helps us see the bias in ourselves. We need tech that helps people understand each other. That understands my business. Dear tech. Dear tech. Dear tech. Dear tech. Let's champion data rights as human rights. Let's use blockchain to help reduce poverty. Let's develop new solutions with the help of quantum technology. Let's show girls that STEM isn't just a boys club. Let's make a difference in people's lives. Let's do it all together. Let's expect more from technology. Let's put smart to work. Oh man, the longer version's had this part where someone says, can we use the blockchain to solve poverty? <laughs> Oh, she said it. Oh, good. I must have just spaced out. <laughs> Reduce poverty. Fair enough. Um, so anyway, in conclusion, I wanted to say I think the fact that IBM is sponsoring an ad like this during the Oscars does indicate that there's a real shift happening in the conversation. The industry as well as the public is reaching a consensus that we do need to talk. And yet, I think what would be interesting for us all to consider, A, is we who, and B, what exactly do we need to talk about? What agendas are being set? by the new movement and by this new momentum of, of criticism and questioning around technology. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I look forward very much to talking with Yarden and hopefully hearing from all of you. Um, I'm very upset that you subjected me to that video. <laughs> I haven't seen it. It was just for you, and you said you hadn't seen it. I decided. It, it combines multiple types of awfulness into one. Um, <laughs> I think it means we're winning. Uh, okay, <laughs> Oof, I'm still recovering. But um, so I, I want to talk about capitalism a little bit um, in the context of, of the things you've raised. So um, social movements are heterogeneous things, obviously, and you know they have disagreements, internal disagreements, uh, questions about their goals and agendas. And I want to talk a little bit about the the heterogeneity within this. Um, uh, tech left. Let's go with that. So I'm curious to what extent are some of these workers uh, questioning the capitalist agenda and I want to the capitalist agenda of their employers and I want to talk about that in the context of this recent Microsoft uh, action that you brought up so uh, last week Microsoft employees uh, protested a contract that the company has with the with the US Army and um, the group calls itself quote Microsoft workers for like the number four good and uh, they say on their page that they are, quote, striving to make Microsoft the corporate leader for ethical accountability, end quote. And 
it's framed around these very abstract goals, like working for the good of all, doing things ethically, and that kind of framing is adopted left and right. You know, the mm -hmm. IBM working with MIT is going to use, you know, quote, AI for the benefit of everyone. You know, every, you know everyone is adopting this kind of uh, framing, even if they're hosting Henry Kissinger, as MIT will be uh, hosting later this week. Uh, so it seems to me that this framing is is both abstract and committed to a corporate structure. So in their open letter, they also say, open letter to Brad Smith, the Microsoft president, they write, uh, quote, uh, we did not sign up to develop weapons and we demand a say in our how our work is used. And uh, to me, this gets to the crux of the matter, right? Because companies like Microsoft have been servicing the military and US imperial interests for decades, and uh, as to the you know workers having no say in how their work is used, isn't that the essence of wage labor? So my question is, to what extent are people questioning that and moving away from these abstract idealizations? Um, and maybe you can tie that into um, data colonialism and other proposals, but we can save that for another question too. But. Yeah, it's a great, so there's a micro, this microphone on me works even though I feel like it doesn't, yeah, okay. Um, it's a great question and I think that the only way to answer is that there's a very wide spectrum of opinions that I've heard expressed by people uh, involved in tech worker actions and I think that those run the gamut, have run the gamut from everyone saying I should prefer not to be sexually harassed at work, <laughs> you know, which feels like a very minimal, minimal claim, uh, to to people who are absolutely voicing their criticisms of their companies uh, in the kind of language you're using, a language of wage labor, capitalist expropriation, exploitation. So I think that just empirically speaking, in terms of the actors involved, there's a pretty wide range uh, from liberal to you know, full Maoist or whatever, you know, there, there's like we're in a new generational moment here. Uh, I think in terms of this question of how easily appropriated some of the, some of the language of these statements or how appropriable it potentially steam, seems, I'm of two minds about that because I think on the one hand, it is true that a certain kind of general sort of doing good language can be very easily assimilated uh, into industry aims that perhaps don't serve whatever the original definition of the good is at all. On the other hand, I will say, and this really came up in the interviews that we did for that logic book, Tech Against Trump, that that, that ide idealizing rhetoric and then the gap between rhetoric and reality actually serves a really important politicizing function for certain people. I think that, um, you know, as sarcastical East Coast academics, it's very easy, you know, perhaps it's easy to have said, well, of course, it was always ridiculous to say your goal was don't be evil or something like that. But people do enter the industry uh, shaped by this very idealistic rhetoric and actually a sense of disappointment when it doesn't seem to be fulfilled, I think can be a very powerful force for change. So yes and no on that second part of the question. And um, so I guess I should be actually standing up. So I'm, I'm wondering um, what you think are the most uh, successful instances of, of actually questioning the term tech worker even, mm -hmm. right? Because um, uh, you've, you've, you've alluded to people building alliances across different types of laborers mm -hmm. and there are real differences. I mean, right. it's nice that um, people who believed in kind of a liberal politics that are very highly paid programmers are, are coming to see, you know, different kinds of truths, but uh, they're still in a very different positions from the people who work in the cafeteria and so right. on. So what are the uh, examples that you think are most successful of actual um, uh, solidarity and, and two, um, is it maybe time then in light of such a solidarity to drop the tech worker term, to retire it? And what I mean by that is, you know, when we say tech, everyone thinks of, uh, you know, Google and, and Facebook in, in this sphere. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, companies, you know, if you have a startup company that's writing some mm -hmm. Python code, that's really valorized as technology, even if it's very derivative or nonsensical or whatever, but, uh, you know, plumbers are not in that category or people mm -hmm. who make parts for vacuum cleaners or for agricultural instruments. So maybe that the, maybe the tech worker actually has a, a negative side to it. Because you're right, it, on the one hand, it, it says you're part of an industry, but on the other hand, it valorizes technology. And then that sort of sets up a stage for people to say, well, how can we use this for good? Which presumes that the tools of, of tech defined as, you know, code, whatever, uh, 
has the potential to do a lot of good. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe a lot of social problems just don't really require that, or it's a minor component. Mm. It's a great question. Yarden is making me look naive and optimistic so I, by comparison. So I'm, uh, I'm always pleased, uh, again, when I'm not the East Coast cynic. I'm just, I'm just teasing you, Yarden. Um, uh, OK, so to this question of tech worker, I, was, I think that this, you're raising a really, two sets, I think, actually, of really important questions. So in the first part of your question, uh, what I hear is this sort of unavoidable question of like how, how far does solidarity go, or how, what are the actual strategies for building meaningful kinds of cooperation, collaboration, solidarity across very different categories of workers. I think often when I think of the phrase tech worker to this thing that Rachel Melendez, who's one of the co-founders of Tech Workers Coalition, said to me, I think the first time I interviewed her, and she said, you know, actually tech companies are always very worried about their diversity. They talk about concerns about diversity, but actually there are a majority of women and majority of people of color on this, I forget which specific tech campus it was, they just don't count most of those people as workers. And I think that what the phrase tech worker has been useful to do as a kind of polemical intervention is precisely to force that paradigm shift, the sense that there is a kind of unity or solidarity to the industry uh, and that and to sort of deprivilege the kinds of you know if you are coding a little bit in Python so certain kinds of work in relation to other because because of course there are also temporary and contract workers who work with code as well and a lot of discrepancies some of them highlighted around the Google walkout between different categories of technical workers I think in terms of those questions of solidarity across different roles, it is striking how much race and gender, I mean, the ways in which I think race and gender can catalyze certain sorts of solidarity, because if you're a woman uh, working on an engineering team at a company or you're a woman working in the cafeteria, you may actually share certain kinds of experience of harassment uh, that are more, that are similar uh, in, in certain ways. I remember talking to folks involved in one of the early organizing efforts around Google who also talked about immigration concerns. You have a lot of H-1B visa workers uh, in the tech industry. And of course, being anx anxious about your immigration status is something that they can share in common uh, with, with other kinds of workers at their companies. In terms of this question of the, well, there, I sort of have tried to address this question of the potential limits to solidarity. I think the other point you raise is really interesting about like what is the tech industry or where is the tech industry. Uh, my co-founder, Ben Tarnoff, likes to say, you know, tech is not a coherent industry anymore. It's like a data layer distributed across, across every industry. And actually, I think JP Morgan employs far more engineers than Facebook, for instance. So there, there it raises this question of like, how do we define the tech company? And is there a sense in which, in light of that, uh, that JP Morgan has more engineers than Facebook, that sort of the coherence of this idea of the tech worker is stretched past what it can bear? I think that, at least for the time being, because of the kinds well, A, because of the rhetorical significance or the symbolic significance that's been attributed accorded to tech companies and because of their real power. I mean, their monopolistic power over certain digital infrastructures of our lives, that it is useful to have a working concept uh, that's meant to catalyze solidarity at, the, at those companies, even if there are sort of fuzzy edges in the way that you bring up. Open it up now to, to I mean, I have a bazillion questions, but I, I'd like to hear from uh, other people. So. Yes. Thank you so much for your talk. I have a question about the relationship between these tech worker activists and the various social responsibility or ethics mm. boards of these companies. Um, what is that relationship exactly? Have they worked together? Could you foresee a future where they're working together? I think, uh, th thank you, it's a, good, it's a good question. I think that, as usual, it's sort of hard for me to generalize because I think I've spoken to people who do and I've spoken to people who don't. I think that if I had to characterize very, very broadly uh, the tech worker activists I've interviewed or spent time with, I'd say there's a fair bit of skepticism uh, about sort of official company attempts to establish ethics boards. I think there is an anxiety among many people that 
it's a form of co-optation that those boards, and I think the Microsoft letter actually talked about this, the most recent Microsoft letter said explicitly, you know, we now have an ethics board, but its procedures are not transparent to us. So I think that among many of them, there is a kind of skepticism and anxiety. On the other hand, I certainly also can think of examples of people who had worked with such internal boards. I mentioned employee resource groups briefly. I feel like there are sort of company organizations that have been important sites for people to meet and articulate concerns as well. So I can't speak for the, the movement in general. I think there's a range of opinions. Hello, how are you? Good, how uh, are you? <laughs> I want to know if there is like a big divide between the engineers and the non-engineers mm -hmm. in these uh, tech workers organizations and how do they deal with that? If you, if, if you interview people that know about this. Because it, it seems to me that the non-engineers are less concerned there's some issues mm. than the engineers, but maybe it's just like a prejudice, but I just mm. want to know what, what you think about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's certainly a division that is relevant uh, insofar as I think tech companies tend to really privilege, privilege you know, the idea of being technical. I think we could critique and question and get into what it means to be technical versus non-technical. And as I mentioned, there are also these big sort of discrepancies among contract and full-time technical roles. That said, what I've encountered uh, is actually real attempts to forge bonds across that division. So again, I keep coming back to this, but the fact that Tech Workers Coalition uh, was co-founded by a cafeteria worker, an engineer, it seems very important to their identity and the idea that sort of both sides of that equation have things to learn from each other is something that's very important to how they talk about their work. Of course, that said, I think another part, and perhaps I should have said this when we were talking about the definition of tech worker earlier, another part of sort of this paradigm is recognizing that different people have different levels of power to affect change depending where they are in the digital production process, and that, you know, it's much more expensive and difficult to, to train a new engineer if they're threatening to withhold their work than it is to train certain other kinds of workers. So there are sort of significant differences there. I think the final thing I'd say is that actually uh, in the work I've done on the Google Walkout, my impression is that actually a lot of people in non-technical roles played, played important roles in the action, I think sometimes, um, again, because of those differences of privilege that I mentioned, different people feel a different level of confidence being public uh, about their role and who can speak uh, in public isn't always everyone uh, who was involved in an action. So I think uh, there, are, there are certain differences of power and privilege and ability to voice in public, but my uh, my findings in my research on this topic has been that there's actually a fair bit of collaboration across roles. Thank you very much. Very interesting and very informative. Um, I guess I, I have a question. I don't know. It's kind of a convoluted thought. Um, but what is the importance of the worker part in the tech worker movement? Because it seems like a lot of these movements have to do with issues that concern us as citizens, so mm. they don't necessarily only concern workers. Mm. And there might be things that workers are best placed to raise and best placed to kind of be active and engaged in, mm -hmm. and other things that are more, you know, perhaps, so may maybe workers have access to more information mm -hmm. and serve a sort of awareness building role for society? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I think that, and I sort of tried to allude to this too with my lame joke that we're all, you know, we're all tech workers insofar as we produce value for, for large tech companies. I think that these concerns and sort of aspirations to have more control over our digital lives, I think these are universal, or at least as you say, concern us as citizens and humans uh, and not necessarily just as as workers. So I think that that's absolutely true. I think, in a sense, I think the emphasis on, on workers is pragmatic. I mean, I think it's on the one hand, it's trying to activate uh, another tradition, a sort of more leftist or socialist tradition of thinking about what democracy is, and democracy not just as the right to go cast a vote every two years, but also to control the conditions of your life and the conditions of your work. Again, that's not something that's unique to people working in tech companies, but I do think um, 
that that label, the, the, word, the emphasis on the word worker is partially trying to activate that tradition. That said, I think that for at least some of these groups and people, part of the urgency around tech workers has been in recognition of the fact that ordinary citizens uh, may have very limited ability to, to influence these kinds of decisions at big companies. So I think that it's less, I certainly don't think it's a rejection of the idea of regulation or pressure from outside or activism by citizen groups. I think it's simply a, a, a recognition of who, given that, um, given these kinds of privileges or sort of given the power in the, in the production process that certain kinds of tech workers have, who's in a position to quickly compel change uh, on issues that seem to be of urgent and pressing interest. Great talk. Um, you. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of labor inserting ethics demands mm -hmm. into their overall labor demands? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like there are probably other people in the room who are more expert on this specific topic than I am, although the one friend I was thinking of seems to have just run away. Uh, I think that what I will say is that I think this aspirate, and I'm seriously, if anyone else has something they want to say to it, please, please come in. I think that in the United States, in the past two decades, we've come to have a very impoverished notion uh, of what labor organizing is for. You know, this idea that it's just for maybe a little bit more money or a little bit more benefits. And I think that this broader notion that these activists are trying to activate, that it's also about controlling the conditions of your work and your life, uh, is something that we've probably lost a lot of the sense of in the United States. Uh, in the past few decades. And I should say organizers of the Google walkout and also organizers involved in actions at some other companies have said, both privately to me and I believe in one case at least in interviews to the press publicly, that they are directly inspired by the workers walking out at McDonald's in relation to sexual harassment, inspired by the recent teacher strikes. So I think that there is um, this broader moment that they're plugging into and participating in. I think that the framework that the activists I spend time with would use to talk about making ethical demands would fall under this broad idea of deserving uh, a say in how your work is used and that being kind of a fundamental, I almost want to say a fundamental human right to shape your labor and what it does in the world. So I think that it's very much part of this sort of more leftist framework of thinking about the democratic. Did you have something specifically in mind? No, I was just curious. I think the internal side of it mm -hmm. seems to fall closer to traditional labor demands. Mm -hmm. But I think the external piece, I was just curious if anybody had examples of the external demand as well. There's some antecedent, and I, I haven't done as much of the research on this as I should, but I know there's a magazine called Programmed World that's published in the Bay Area in the 80s that I often think of as a kind of ancestor to logic that tries to, one of many ancestors, uh, but that tries, was focused on trying to get engineers to care about opposing military projects, opposing Star Wars, um, that kind of thing. Other than that, specific antecedents in the tech industry don't come to mind, but maybe others have ideas about it in the room. Yeah. I was going to mention the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists mm -hmm. that is trying As you obviously know, the, the Science for the People, right. but they had a subset of, of people working in industry there too, so it wasn't just um, full-time activists, not just academics, and they also addressed some of these issues. Um, yeah, I think, and there's also a sense, I think, that there, and this is something that I know gets talked about here at the Berkman, but the idea that there are special areas of expertise or certain kinds of work that have, because of their particularly profound consequences for other people, that there need to be uh, ways that for folks who have the specific technical or scientific expertise to, that there need to be standards and kind of uh, regulations uh, that, they, that they are held to. It's funny, I know that one of, the, one of the early groups that was active in the Bay Area, and actually in a number of cities hosting events, Tech Solidarity, would talk about needing an organization for engineers on the lines of like, a librarians or an American Medical Association, some kind of, and they weren't framing it precisely as in these sort of labor terms, but that there needed to be like a professional association that could impose certain certain codes of contact. And I definitely see continuities there uh, with work in other kinds of science, science industries. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, 
I'm just wondering if you are aware of any uh, attempts to uh, uh, codify these demands, these organizing uh, demands into either, either federal law or state law, because it seems to me a little short-sighted to just rely on the benevolence of a corporation and not, not get anything, anything long-term. Yeah, the, I think, I mean, they're abs or sorry, did you already want to? No, I was going to say, again, I think that a lot of the emphasis on the ability of workers to influence what's happening in the company is pragmatic, and it's sort of, a, you know, it is recognizing the fact that for various reasons it's been hard to regulate these industries, and, to, and in some cases also, anyway, it's curious, I think the triangulation of sort of workers, companies, and government is a bit is a bit complicated, too, in the case of the military contracts anyway. But I absolutely don't think, I'm running through my head of folks I've interviewed and talked to, and I can't think of anyone who would be opposed uh, to citizen organizing uh, to try to pass laws on some of these matters. I think that it's, uh, it's an in addition, a sort of in addition to, not a, in place of, or in opposition to kind of proposition. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I read Logic Magazine and I really love it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so my question was, I guess, kind of returning back to the idea of tech worker being really a range of identities, like a range of socioeconomic yeah. positions. And I'm wondering in your interviews or in your observations, if you have seen like people negotiating that kind of tension, I guess, even within the tech workers coalition, where you know someone who's working as a cafeteria worker is making a significantly different income than someone who's working as a software engineer. And I'm wondering how that impacts kind of even like the power structures within that organization. Um, and also just the negotiation that has to happen between understanding the kinds of unevenness of wages and even exploitation within um, a company versus what they're trying to fight for in solidarity against um, bigger institutions. Yeah. Um, well, I think that that process of negotiation in many ways, like in any organizing environment, plays out to like really pragmatic and concrete strategies for fostering conversation and trying to make sure that there are good procedures for lots of different people to be involved in the conversation and for those power differentials which are so real and pressing in the world not to overdetermine or structure what's happening within an organization. Of course, there is the problem, which I don't know of any solution to in any volunteer or activist organization of you know who has time, who has time to come, to come to a lot of meetings and be involved. And of course, uh, in tech worker organizing as in any any kind of organizing that's going to tend to favor more, more privileged people with more resources um, and time to do it. So I think that it's, again, it's hard to give a sort of broader intellectualized answer to the question. I feel like it often plays out in these very sort of day-to-day -day pragmatics of facilitation ways. And all I can say is that it's a, it's a real and difficult question, like how, how to, in the long term to negotiate these real power differences uh, within a movement, but it's not a question. It's not a question without precedence. Uh, and I think that you know, I think of the feminist movement or other kinds of political movements that cross a lot of different power positions and identity categories. And I think that in the end, it's about framing things in terms of shared interests and coalition building and solidarity, and not sort of um, patronizing or these more privileged people are going to do something altruistic or philanthropic or something for other people. I think that it's about finding the points uh, of shared interest and connection. So, sorry, if I can uh, ju jump in here. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, I think it's, a, it's relevant to, to what we're just discussing. Uh, you mentioned before that you think um, feminist Marxists have some of the ah. most interesting <laughs> things to say about this. And since yeah. we're talking about frameworks and ethics, um, I'd like to hear more uh, about that, uh, how to think about all these diverse identities. And I was... Um, really struck by uh, your analysis of the, of the Me Too movement and the movement becoming a hashtag in your piece, uh, The Internet of Women, in Logic Magazine again. So when you write, uh, and I, I think this is interesting because it exemplifies the kind of approach one would need to make sense of all these different identities and forms of labor, you write, um, as legacy media, meaning in, in this context, magazines, as legacy media desperately try to snatch clicks with hashtag MeToo content, they continue to hemorrhage eyeballs and money to big tech. 
as they throw young women to the internet as clickbait, the companies that own the internet, companies bigger and more male than any major male magazine <laughs> will ever be, circle them. So I, so, so I think uh, if you could just say more about that, how you see uh, Marxist feminism or whatever framework you, you like to work with fitting into this, these uh, discussions. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel this is a nice opportunity for me because I was, as I was sort of half reading and half talking my talk, I, I felt I was going on too long, so I cut out a bunch of stuff about theory uh, towards the end. I think, so, end of the day, and I think this actually maybe is less specifically relevant to the tech worker organizing within companies than like broadly relevant to how we think about power and digital accumulation in this moment in general. I think that the Marxist feminist tradition by which I'm thinking of, you know, wages for housework, people also like Leopoldina Fortunati. There's actually a book uh, by a scholar named Kylie Jarrett called The Digital Housewife that gets into a lot of this. That frameworks, uh, frameworks for thinking about activities that produce value uh, but aren't quite labor and aren't quite natural resource extraction, uh, you know, like care work and family work and all sorts, all kinds of unwaged domestic activities. These are things that feminists have been thinking about for a long time. I think that it's very striking, a lot of scholarship uh, in the 90s, early 2000s through today about the web uh, and the forms of wealth and power that the web made it possible for a few tech companies to accumulate, describe this as novel. It's sort of that it's sort of novel that parts of life that aren't part of contracted wage labor have a relationship to capital and are now producing value. I think that the, the precise use of, of a more Marxist feminist tradition is to say, well, no, actually, <laughs> this is as old as capitalism itself. So it was a very broad sort of intellectual point that's what I'm trying to get at in that context. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a question about, so one way you might think that the, one way you might interpret the tech worker organization is that it's a post, end of post ideology reaction mm. given its, sort of like genealogical relationship to the 60s and 70s and counterculture and an escape from politics and it's a realization that we that's never going to be successful mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what the whether you can understand what the final ends of a movement like this is seeking I think one of the main critiques about um, frameworks like surveillance capitalism and platform capitalism mm -hmm. is that they have a lot to say about surveillance and platform and almost nothing to say about capitalism. <laughs> and I've, I wonder, since many of these demands are emerging out of concerns about survey, like ICE type surveillance, mm -hmm. there's a, there does seem to be a lack of any maybe deeper questioning about the systemic structural reliance on exploitation and de-skilling that capitalism requires. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether that's also on the table within mm. these tech worker movements as well? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like with so many of these questions, I'm sort of toggling between what, what I think intellectually and theoretically and then what I've heard other people say. I think that your line that, but, I mean, I think actually Nick Cernicek's book on platform capitalism is quite concerned with capitalism, but I think the criticism of Shoshana Zuboff's book that, um, that it's not uh, feels, I think she's a giant. I really appreciate a lot of her work, uh, but I do think that that's a fair, a fair criticism and that her account uh, of the harms of surveillance capitalism seems to presuppose that there was sort of a good capitalism that was based on reciprocity. I think another, another aspect of all this that's very interesting to me is sort of the, the focus, maybe I think in scholarship, certainly in the media on sort of the attention economy and sort of the specific focus on the harms to the attention of, of individual users as opposed to the harms of other kinds of technology. So I think that uh, in some of these accounts of surveillance, uh, a focus on you know, the dehumanizing effects or the sort of uh, disempowering effects of having your attention directed are perhaps overstated in relation to other other kinds of harms. I think that for most most people, probably the algorithms that schedule their work or determine whether they get health care are more of more pressing importance to their lives than whether or not, you know, a Facebook algorithm showed them a fake news story. So I think that your point 
that it's really important for the critique of surveillance capitalism to be not just about surveillance, but about capitalism is absolutely right. I think seeing this as an end of post-ideology is also absolutely, absolutely right. If we think of that sort of Californian ideology moment as the apotheosis of something I see starting in the white counterculture in the 60s of sort of letting personal expression replace politics and think that you can have a kind of expressive politics without infrastructure or without collective movements, uh, that the what we're seeing is absolutely uh, a recognition that that model does not work, or at least not for most people. I think finally that there are absolutely activists within this movement uh, who would share the, the feelings you just articulated about the limitations of the surveillance capitalism account and the sense that capitalism needs to be challenged, that there isn't sort of a, a rosy good market capitalism that only recently has gone a little bit astray, but that it's part of a much longer history of gendered and racialized violent exploitation. I think, again, I hesitate to make a very broad generalization about all the people involved in this movement because it's a wide, wide range of people, but I think there absolutely are people who would share the kinds of criticisms that you're raising. I really enjoyed this talk. I was just wondering about the, um, let's say, looking, being a bit of a futurist and thinking about the people who sign petitions or, you know, do walkouts and the effects on their career. When you think about whistleblowers, you see what ha happens to their careers and, you know, maybe a tech person, a highly uh, skilled software engineer has less concern about, well, if you get rid of me, I can get a job right. versus someone who's a tech work, you know, like contract workers, like, if you get rid of me, I'm going to be homeless, right. you know, that kind of thing. I'm just curious about, you know, does it put a, a mark, even though they're doing, quote unquote, the right thing, does it put a mark on their relationship to the larger ecosystem? Yeah, I think it's a complicated question. And to me, it seems like a sort of tactical question that each person has to think about for themselves. There are certainly workers like highly skilled engineers. And I think in some cases, highly visible engineers who can use that privilege to their to their advantage. Uh, I think that there are examples of people, Liz Fong Jones comes to mind, but people who are engineers with a large sort of Twitter presence and, and following who are actually, it's this curious calculation, but how do you use that level of visibility, which could be a liability? Uh, also to protect you in a certain sense. And again, I think that's sort of an individual calculation. In the long run, the thing I will say, uh, at risk again of sounding naively optimistic, is that I think that there is a way in which the more of these actions there are, the more people feel empowered to participate in them. Uh, I feel as if, particularly in some of the debates around military contracts, you often hear this argument that, you know, well, if you don't build it, other people will, um, and, and so you should just build it. And I think that on the contrary, what we're seeing uh, is, is this moment where because some people are saying they're not going to do it actually, people at other companies can say that too. So I think that, you know, the pragmatic answer is that people with more privilege and who feel for whatever set of reasons that they have the resources to do so can kind of take the risks on behalf of, of the person who might be homeless next week if they're not working. And then in the long term, I do think you know, the power of collective action is that they can't fire all of you. Uh, and as, as more and more of these of these actions take place and succeed in their immediate aims, more people feel empowered to participate in them. Was there a specific backlash that you know of against uh, particularly lower paid uh, uh, employees at these companies for signing petitions, for striking, for walking out? I haven't followed it uh, yeah. closely enough to. Not that I'm aware of. I think I can think of one specific instance at one of the large companies where there's been organizing uh, around unionizing lower wage workers where they were, I'm trying to think how to put this, they were told they could do something and then their contracting company was like, no, you can't do that. And they were sort of frightened by all coming to work and finding leaflets that said that they would get in trouble if they did this thing that they'd said they were going to do. Uh, but other than that one example, I shouldn't say authoritatively that there haven't been instances of backlash, but nothing comes to mind. I think there's also an interesting dynamic since so many of the lower wage positions, uh, the, the people in question work for contract companies, not for the big famous tech company, where that difference can be kind of leveraged. So for instance, I think when the Facebook workers won their union, I believe there were certain dynamics where, you know, engineers at Facebook sort of pressured Facebook to say that certain conditions should be met. I actually, I don't remember the very specific details of that incident, but I think that that difference between the 
you know, cafeteria contracting company and the large tech company and the relatively more idealistic public facing rhetoric of the large tech company has been used to try to protect uh, contract workers. One more time for Thank a wonderful presentation. Thank you so presentation. much. Thank you for being here.